Uh, I tell you, it's worth coming up here just to get introduced by Charlie. <laughs> <You know? laughs> All right, first thing you notice, he doesn't have his boots on tonight, but he's got his purple socks on. You need to know that, because that is the colors of the TCU. And every day of his life, he gets up and he pulls on some purple socks. And these are tonight's version, so there you go. Uh, you know why? Why? Well, I'll tell you why. It, I didn't plan it this way, but when TCU went to the Rose Bowl five or six years ago, and we hadn't been to the Rose Bowl since 1937, so it was, it was a really big deal. So I got up at this uh, pep rally, and I, I was just trying to think of something to say that nobody else had said, and I said, if you guys win, I will wear purple socks for the rest of my life. I had no idea <laughs> they were going to win. They won. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably worth it for you. <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. Uh, we have much to talk about, including this book, which is really about, uh, it's about the, where the world of communication is today and, and what the implications are. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about uh, his storied career as also talk about a, a bit of politics because he's been, you know, watching politics for four or five uh, decades. But first, a moment about Las Vegas and about this country and, and what's happening and a sense of, of the horrific nature of someone uh, shooting and killing more than 56 people that he doesn't even know. I think it's up over 60 now, Charlie. And uh, more than 500 people now have been wounded. And as yet, we still don't know what the motive right. for this is. And to me, uh, that, that is the part that I really don't understand. I, I think the Las Vegas Police Department, the Sheriff's Department has done a very good job uh, I think they've been uh, very forthcoming in keeping us up to date on where the investigation is. But as yet, nobody even has a theory about what this person is up to. And so we have uh, a long way to go before we, we sort this out. But this is just horrific. And these guns now are so powerful that the New York Times, and I'm sure many of you saw uh, the editorial today, since, the, since that awful shooting in Orlando at the club uh, in June of uh, 2016, when uh, that, up until that point, that was the most people ever killed in one mass killing. In the 400, and I think it is 65 days since then, we have had more than 500 mass shootings in this country. And by mass shootings, that means at least four people were, were shot. We, 500, I think, and 85 people have died uh, since the shooting in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we keep offering hopes and prayers, but nothing ever happens. These things just keep on happening. The guns keep getting more powerful. Uh, where do we go from here? I, I wish I knew. Yeah, but I mean, right now, I, I don't know where this goes. Yes, and, and no one knows. I mean, I did a program about it tonight, which is on 11 o'clock. And, and we, we, you know, we, with some reporters who were there, as well as, as someone who's an expert on this kind of thing, these kind of shootings. And, you know, the question is motive. And the question is, you know, there's no apparent grievance that we see. And we clearly know that this man, it seems that way, intended to kill himself all along. And he killed himself before the police arrived. So it wasn't a death by a cop, as, as the phrase goes. And so the, the search is now, as the reporters and, and, and the police look at his computer and look at everything and talk to anybody who might have talked to him, uh, how long had he been planning this? Um, how carefully did he plan it? All of these questions, and to what end? And, and what is it about uh, the individual mind that leads him to do something with no caring for human life? Uh, but it is a troublesome event in America because it seems to be happening more and more. Uh, I want to turn now to this book that Bob has written. What's fascinating as a first story is how you came to write this. And I mean, the conversation you had, and we'll meet your co-author, uh, but the conversation you had with someone who basically said, what's happening in journalism is an issue of national security. Yes, uh, John Hamry, who is the head of uh, CSIS in Washington, which is the Center for Strategic and International Study, uh, it's, uh, I think, the leading think tank in Washington, but there's some other really good ones. 
Uh, but Dr. Hamry, uh, who was Deputy Secretary of Defense in the uh, Clinton administration and is a true defense intellectual, he's respected by people on both sides and all sides uh, of foreign policy issues. Uh, we were having coffee uh, with Andrew Schwartz, who uh, was with me on this book. He's the uh, Chief of Communications at CSIS. And we were just talking about journalism and where it is today. And, and with all of this fake news, with all of the questions about what can you believe and all of that, Dr. Henry said, this is a national security issue. And so Andrew and I uh, started this series of podcasts where we just started calling up people in all parts of journalism, uh, the editor of the Washington Post, reporters for Politico. Uh, we did uh, 44 podcasts starting in uh, the summer of 2016, and we got about, I would say, into about 10 of them, and we thought, you know, this might make, uh, might make a, the usual Washington report that think tanks put out, and then the more we thought about it, I said, you know, if I'm gonna do something like that, I want people to read it. <laughs> I don't think there's any other reason to write a report or a book, so we decided to make a book out of it, and, and that's how this book uh, uh, came about. It was a fascinating process and project because what the book is about is that we are in the midst of a communications technology revolution that is having as profound effect on our culture and the people of our time as the invention of the printing press had on the people of that day. Uh, but the difference is, while the, while the printing press improved literacy, it caused the uh, Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, it also was followed by 30 years of religious wars, and it was literally 30 years, three decades, before equilibrium was reached in Europe. We're at the very beginning of this communications revolution. It is having a profound effect on all of our institutions, but especially on the way we get our news and also on our politics. And we're right in the middle of it well, right now. I want to talk about, I assume the title Overload means how much news there is out yes. there and, and, and how do we respond to it. But there's also this, you quote, quote Michael Oreskes, who's the president of, of NPR. The scarcest resource in journalism, in journalism now is attention span. We used to live in a world governed by the laws of physics, time and space, time on the air, space in a newspaper. They were our key constraints. The reality controlling force in the world right now is how long can you keep your audience, your followers, consuming the journalism you create? That's right. And this has come about for several reasons. Number one, the decline of newspapers. Uh, we all know uh, because of the coming of the web, which has drained away the advertising that used to be the life's blood for our newspapers, newspapers, as we have known them, are, are going away. We have lost 126 newspapers over, over the, uh, the last 12 years. Here's an interesting statistic. In 2004, one reporter in eight lived in Washington, New York, or Los Angeles. Now that number is down to one reporter in five lives in one of those three cities. So when you get out into the Midwest and across the Rust Belt, it's not a question of whether people are getting biased news, they're getting no news from reliable sources. Most of their news is now coming from Facebook and social media. 63% of the people today. 63% now get at least some of their news uh, from Facebook, which is fine, it's a great way to uh, have communication with your neighbors and what's going on in the neighborhood and your relatives. But things that appear on Facebook have not gone through the editing process that you would be used to seeing on the front page of your local newspaper in days gone by and, and in the mainstream media. For example, I mean, those at CBS or the New York Times or the Washington Post or, or at the good newspapers that are left, uh, you can generally assume that we don't broadcast or publish something, Charlie, unless we've gone to some trouble to find out if it's true. Uh, that is not the standard that's being followed uh, throughout social Every, media. Yeah, so many people can be their own publishers, what, what's happened. Yeah, and basically... It's the personification of the media. What happened yesterday after this horrendous event happened in Las Vegas, 
social media was filled with all kinds of stories. The first one was that the shooter was an anti-Trump liberal who liked Rachel Maddow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. That's, that's what it was. And they also said that he had converted to Islam and was associated with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. All of those things, all of those topics are absolutely false and totally without foundation. But I actually called CBS yesterday. Uh, something kicked up on my phone that said he had converted to Islam. And I called uh, one of the producers at uh, Charlie's broadcast. And I said, is that right? And I said, no, there's, no it's no totally wrong. But that's what's happened now. So who can blame people when they say, who do I believe? Who can I trust? There's so much out there. We're being bombarded so, from all sides 24 seven by this stuff. And it's, it's just almost impossible to separate the wheat from the chaff. So everybody in this audience is saying, so how do we do it? How do we, how do we figure out what's true uh, and what's real? Well, I think the first thing we have to do, Joe Nye, who's a national security expert up at Harvard and, and has been in various administrations, said, we'll never defeat this by just simply answering every lie. What you have to do is you have to inoculate people beforehand, make them aware of what's going on and what they might expect. And I, I think that's the best way to do it. But there are going to have to be some major reforms. I mean, Facebook and Google for a time uh, were saying, look, we're not a media company. Uh, we're a technology company. And we can't be responsible for what shows up on our website. Now, this is, this is a company that 62% of the American people or many of them depending on it as their only source of news and many for some news. You have to take responsibility. I, and I think they are beginning, they to, are beginning, beginning to realize that, that they have to. They are beginning to do that. And that, that is the most hopeful sign that's, that's happened so far. But in the beginning, uh, this thing just got, a, got away from everybody before we really realized the significance so of what So what was would happening. be the pushback? Is The pushback is that people are becoming alarmed uh, in terms of what they hear and see and not knowing what's true. If in, after the printing press was invented, there was a pushback, is the pushback we're experiencing now uh, the sense of credibility of news? Yes, and, and let's make no mistake, the Russians are playing a role in this. There is no question that they are. Uh, at CSIS, uh, Heather Conley, one of the scholars there, has done a, uh, a study called the Kremlin Playbook. She's gone through and looked across Central Europe at the uh, behavior of the Russians there. The Russians don't drive their tanks across borders anymore. They found out it's much cheaper to use cyber and to, and to adopt a kind of soft power methods. And basically what they're doing in these countries is they're bribing local officials, they're making sweetheart deals with local businessmen in these uh, countries, making loans to them, uh, things of that nature, and doing everything they can to destabilize the press and, and to raise questions about the credibility of the press in these countries. And they've had remarkable success with that, and if any of that sounds familiar, it's what has been going on in this country over the last year or so. Oh, we There's want to talk no about question, and all of our intelligence people uh, agree uh, with that assessment. The only person who questions it is the president. The president and, 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 and Steve Bannon. Yeah. <laughs> the question of newspapers, just for a moment, because I knew you came from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the great newspaper in Texas in Fort Worth. Uh, the Washington Post has turned things around. Yeah. Uh, Jeff is. Bezos bought the Washington Post and, and has helped them understand how to use the electronic media. They, they have. And the Post, I must say, is leading the way because we, we're focused on, on the bad news of what's happening uh, with this uh, technology revolution. But there's some very good news there. And the Washington Post, uh, with Marty Barron uh, as the editor, has found a way for newspapers to survive. And I think if, if newspapers do survive this, uh, I think Jeff Bezos is going to deserve uh, most of no, the No, you said he single-handedly saving the newspaper business. He may single-handedly have done it. What they have done is they're no longer a newspaper company. And I would add 
the New York Times is doing very much the same thing now. These companies are no longer just companies that publish a newspaper. They have turned themselves into media companies and they are producing a product that goes out on a variety of platforms. Uh, they're digital platform, they put out newsletters every day. Uh, they're finding just more and more ways uh, to reach their viewers. Uh, the Washington Post now has a video division right. where they where they put out videos to supplement uh, their news coverage. But in the old days, at both the uh, Times and the Post, uh, you know, everybody wandered in about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they went and covered their beats, uh, talked to their sources. Uh, then everybody got back to the office about 5.30 and, and wrote for a seven o'clock deadline. And, and then everybody went home and they came back the next day and did the same thing. Now, all of these companies uh, have completely changed their schedules. The Washington Post, first uh, White House correspondent, and they have six of them now covering the White House. Uh, he goes on duty at 6 a.m. along with an editor back in the office, and they're on Tweet Patrol. And they, exactly. they yeah. and that's, yeah. that's where a lot of the news, as you well know, is happening. Because the tweeter gets up very early. Yeah. <laughs> Why is he up at those hours? Would somebody explain uh, that to me? I, I still don't understand Before I turn that. to, to talking <laughs> about... But that's, that's just what they're doing. And the Post, let me just add to the point, Charlie. The Post is in the black for the last two years. They're making money again. Uh, they hired 60 reporters this year. And uh, they, they are one of the great success stories uh, in newspapers right now. The real crisis in journalism, though, is at the local level. Right. At these, at these uh, medium-sized towns uh, across America. Uh, the newspaper used to be where people turned uh, to get their basic facts about things. They based their opinions on those facts. If, but now they're having such a hard time finding a business model that allows them to uh, hire the staff needed to do investigative reporting and stuff like that. If some entity does not come along that will be able to do what we've expected from local newspapers over the years, we'll have corruption in this country at a level we, we have never experienced because basically the local newspaper is the person or the entity that keeps an eye on the local government. Right. So there'll be no coverage of corruption, no coverage of malfeasance, there'll be no coverage of the kinds yeah. of things that newspapers have done in the past. And they're, they're doing their best, and they're, they're trying different kinds of things, but many of these papers no longer have a city hall reporter. Uh, they send somebody to cover the city, hall, the city council meeting, but nobody goes to city hall every day to check on what's going on uh, at, at the local level. In 21 of the 50 states, Charlie, there is not a single newspaper now that sends a reporter to Washington to cover the congressional delegation. Yeah. That's, that's what's happening to our local newspapers. What, you know, the interesting thing, too, is that the life of a reporter has changed, as Bob suggested. I mean, you were really, you know, you were sending out electronic, electronically, either by tweeting a whole, you, you're looking at your, at your mobile device all the time to see where news is. Because when Bob uh, began and when I began, you know, there were the three network newscasts. You know, there were the major newspapers, uh, and they had reporters in Washington. Uh, today, uh, you are starting with the consumption of news from the moment you get up throughout the day. So by the time the evening news comes on, you pretty much know the stories yeah. and what's going on. And, and you are reading it from a variety of sources because reporters are constantly tweeting out. They have to to stay current. Uh, and to do the job that, that they're required to do today. And, 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 and here's, here's another thing. In those days, which I call the gatekeeper era uh, of journalism, where you had uh, three television stations in every town and everybody had a pretty good uh, newspaper uh, in their town, people generally based their opinions on the data they got from those sources. Now, with the echo chamber uh, channels that we have and, and so many of the uh, social media uh, channels out there, if you, if you get your news from this source over here, you're also getting one set of facts. If you get it from this source over here, you're getting another set of facts. So what has happened is we're now basing our opinions on separate sets of facts. We no longer have common data that we're basing our opinions on. So is it any wonder that the partisan divide 
grows deeper and wider. Yeah, this is a famous here. quote of our late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, you remember, who said, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. <laughs> but now we're all, that, we all come equipped with our own yeah, facts. Yeah, and, but, but contrasted that to someone who says, when being questioned on national television, said, we have our own facts. Yeah. We have alternative facts yeah. uh, to the story that you were discussing. You know, uh, in the Oxford uh, Dictionary, uh, post-truth. Was in, 19, in 2016, yes. it was a word of the year. Word of the year was post-truth. Yeah. Um, let me talk about this administration where you've been in Washington for all those years. Uh, you said at one thing, one time that it was a stain on everything uh, the administration was that it touched. Uh, have you seen politics like this ever before? No. No, I haven't. How is it different? Well, it's just totally different. I mean, I, I, this is, I mean, this is true. I, I said on television so many times this year, I've, or last year, I've never seen anything like this. It became a drinking game among the young people at CBS News. Every time old Bob said, I've never seen anything, down the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God they had designated drivers. I mean, <laughs> but no, Charlie, I haven't. And uh, I don't know anybody who has. I mean, this was the most unusual election uh, in the most unusual year that I think uh, I, I, I ever saw. I mean, there's so many things that you just said, Mike, did that really happen? I mean, my, my favorite moment in 2016 was when the speaker at that time, John Boehner, called Ted Cruz uh, Lucifer in the flesh. <laughs> and the Devil Worshipper Society put out a press release and denied it. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Yeah. You can look it up. All right. <laughs> That's how unusual it was. You were surprised that he won. Donald Trump. Yeah, won. I was not surprised that he uh, that he got the nomination. I, I kind of thought early on that he was going to get the nomination, and I remember. Well, he was I, way ahead in the polls in the nomination. Uh, I was up at Harvard doing a fellowship, and I said, I think Donald Trump is going to get the nomination on the Republican side. And boy, you think there wasn't a lot of coughing and eye rolling and things like that? People just couldn't believe I'd come to that conclusion, but. He, he figured out early on, he crafted a message, and he, he knew there were people out there, especially across the Rust Belt, that felt like they just were not getting a fair deal, and the government wasn't doing anything, and I think they, they uh, just decided, it's not going well, we need a change, and I'll just take a flyer on him. Now, they, they might tell you in different words the reason they voted for him, but I, I think that's... That's a big part of it. Uh, he also ran a new kind of campaign. I mean, I think one of the things that hurt Hillary Clinton was she ran a very old-fashioned kind of campaign. And by that, I mean control the narrative, never put your candidate in a position where she might be asked a question she doesn't know the answer to, control the narrative. And so she didn't appear on very many uh, television right. programs. She was hardly ever on the Sunday show. Trump was shows. much more accessible than... And Trump figured out early on, if you call up a certain number of television programs, you're going to get on some of them. Right. And if you say something outlandish, you, you're going to get invited uh, to be on some more of them. And he just overwhelmed her with exposure. Uh, in this sense, I mean, we took a lot of criticism, criticism by saying, you know, we, we gave him too much time uh, and we didn't push back. We did push back, but he was getting on television so much that you'd push back on this and he's out there talking about something else. And so I think a lot of this campaign uh, and the reason she lost and he won came, came down to tactics. There is a... Uh, there's a, uh, a political consultant named Linton Crosby. He's from Australia, and he, he worked in some of David Cameron's campaigns in, um, in, in Great Britain. And he said one time, he had what he called the dead cat theory of politics. And, and the way that ran was, say you're having a dinner party, and no matter what you're talking about, if somebody throws a dead cat on the table, you're gonna start talking about the dead cat. <laughs> well, over and over, Donald Trump would throw a dead cat on the table. I mean, he would start the day 
you know, uh, saying something, and if there was something that had happened yesterday, he'd say something that had no relation to it whatsoever, and that before you know it, for the rest of the day, uh, the other candidates, both Republicans and Democrats, were responding to what he said. And uh, he was not a traditional uh, politician in, in any sense of the word, but he did have some understanding of television. Uh, Secretary Clinton, in a conversation with me a week or so ago, said that she, she believes, and she's written about this, that James, she would have won except for that last uh, announcement by James Comey, the director of the FBI, that he was reopening the investigation because of Anthony Weiner's computer. She may have. Uh, she may have, and uh, I, I don't know that. I do know there were, there were late voters that did break for, for President Clinton that uh, even the Clinton campaign was not aware of because they... For, President, for, for her or for, for, for Trump? Uh, for her. The late voters did. Uh, yeah. I mean, there were late voters that were breaking for him. Right. Uh, that even the Clinton campaign didn't know about because they had stopped polling uh, by that time. But uh, whether, whether that was enough to cause her to win, I really don't know. Uh, you know, the one question that, that she has not been able, was never able to answer was, why did she do the emails in the first place? And why did her campaign, and perhaps they tried, why didn't they say to her, look, this is more trouble than it can ever be worth. She knew she was gonna run for president when she was uh, doing those, those emails. And so I think, I think that is the real question. Did, but, did that last uh, minute uh, disclosure by Comey, yeah. is that what actually tipped? Some it may have. Some people ask the question, and you bring this up in, the, in this book, um, how did the country nominate two of the least popular politicians? Well, I think there's a reason. Party. I think there's a reason for that, and part of it has to do with this revolution in technology that has changed the way we campaign and all of that. But I think our electoral system, the way we select and elect our candidates, is, it's not completely broken down, but it's in worse shape than the roads and bridges in this country, and uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, the system has completely and totally been overwhelmed by money. Uh, redistricting, uh, gerrymandering of districts, that's also had a lot to do with it. But the bottom line is, we have made running for office in this country so onerous, so awful, that our best and brightest people are simply turning away from it, and they want nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, I, I had a young woman who worked for me for a while, and she started dating a congressman who was a very nice young man. And uh, she went home to tell her dad, and it was like he had told her that she had come home and said, I've just decided to, to start going out with this bank robber. I mean, he didn't care if he was a Democrat or a Republican. He was, he, a, politician. He was a politician. And he just couldn't imagine, you know, and, and it went through a, a while there uh, where... She, she's top dating the guy. She wasn't that serious about him in the first place. But uh, she got no encouragement for her, you know, from her, her parents for that. You know, Charlie, and this is true. When I was a little boy, my grandmother thought that I was going to be president of the United States when I grew up because that's what every grandmother thought about their grandson. My grandmother thought I was going to be a bank robber. Yeah. <laughs> but let me ask you this. <laughs> My grandmother and all those grandmas thought I, their grandsons were going to grow up to be president. But how many people have you talked to lately who say, I sure hope my kid grows up to be a politician. Yeah. Uh, you can count them on your nose because it's just, uh, people are just, they, they want nothing to do with it. We have got to find some way to convince our best and brightest and our good people that public service is something that is honorable and is needed and is what has made this country uh, what it is today because too many people just simply want nothing to do with it. And I think that's, that has something to do with how do you wind up with two candidates that, and Charlie's right, uh, a majority of, uh, of voters neither liked nor trusted. Uh, let's make an assessment uh, in terms of how President Trump is doing in government, in governing, as he turned from politician, I mean, as he turned from uh, campaigning to transition 
uh, to the responsibility of government. Uh, his legislative goals are still yet to be realized. Uh, Obamacare repealed and replaced didn't happen. Uh, tax reform has been announced. We'll see what happens. Immigration, he's had uh, travel bans that have been challenged in the court, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen to that. Um, he says he's going to build a wall. On national security, uh, he talks about America first. There was some pushback from that. We don't know whether he's going to uh, withdraw from the Iran deal. Uh, he said that he has made up his mind, but won't say what he's going to do. Um, he faces it. You, you're smiling, mean you know what he's going to do? No. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> yeah. uh, so how is he doing? Well, I, I think um, if you would be a conservative, you would say he selected an honorable and certainly a well-qualified person uh, to be on the Supreme Court. Justice Gorsuch. Uh, just, and that, that, I think you have to mark, give him credit for that. But uh, I, I don't see much else happening here. And the government uh, seems without direction at this point to me. It seems more in, in chaos than, than uh, in, in getting things done or in governing. Uh, I mean, it's become kind of a revolving door there at the White House. And I, I don't know, uh, I don't know where I don't know where this goes, but... Uh, uh, but there's even a civil war within the Republican Party, it seems. Well, yeah. Clearly, I mean, clearly here is the President of the United States attacking first his own Attorney General, who he appointed, Jeff Sessions, attacking him because he, what he did in nominating yeah. uh, or, or allowing the nomination or withdrawing from recusing himself uh, from the case and allowing his Deputy Attorney General to appoint Robert Mueller. There is the attack on Mitch McConnell who helped him get Judge Gorsuch yeah. approved. And there's an, an attack on Paul Ryan. There is as much division between Republicans as it between Republicans and Democrats. Well, you know, when people used to ask me, I covered Congress for 15 years, and it was always my, my favorite beat. I covered the White House for nearly six years, and that was fun too. But people used to say, uh, why do you like covering the Congress better? And I always said, you know, because when you cover the White House, everybody at the White House works for the same person. <laughs> uh, when you're up there on Capitol Hill, they're all independent contractors, and that's where you find news. <laughs> and so, uh, to me, that was the dream job. But, you know, that no longer is apt because there are as many factions now inside the White House as there are up on Capitol Hill. I mean, I mean, uh, I, I talk to these reporters uh, up there, and uh, I'll say, well, now, if you want to talk to the Kushners, who do you talk to? And they said, well, I go to, they have their own spokesman. Uh, or in Bannon, Bannon used to handle his own press, but everybody just went directly to him. Uh, if you want to talk to uh, Gary Cohn and, and those folks, uh, you go to somebody else. It's, I, I've never uh, witnessed a, a, a White House quite like this one. And, uh, and you know, where, is so much of it is not about policy, it's just unfamiliarity with process. Uh, or unfamiliarity with governing. Uh, and they, you know, I mean, you just need somebody uh, that could kind of say, you know, the men's room is down this hall, <laughs> and the ladies' room is over here, and, and the cafeteria is back over there. I mean, it just helps to have somebody like that. But, I mean, I see, you know, I mean, this is not important, uh, and I stress this, but it's just kind of an example of the disorganization. You'll see press releases with misspelled words, yeah. and and uh, the names of people and their their positions misstated, and you just wonder. I mean, how did they get through the day? Well, they they appointed a, they <laughs> appointed alone. they appointed a four-star general, John Kelly, to bring order, and then the tweets continue. I mean, he might have well, brought he, order to the I staff, think he, I think but he not has to the brought president. some order. I mean, he to has, the president. Well, uh, not necessarily order, but I mean, he has kind of <laughs> become kind of a gatekeeper for the Oval Office. I mean, who gets in? Uh, who gets in? I mean, I'm told that people just were wandering in and out. I've had uh, people tell me that we're over there uh, on business, and and four or five people will walk in you know, and walk up to the president, whisper something. I mean, it's just, it's unlike anything that any of us are familiar with. Uh, how, how, how much of a threat is the Russian investigation to the president? You know, 
I don't know whether the president has done anything wrong uh, in connection with the Russians. But every action that he takes is the action of someone who, who appears to have something to hide. Now, whatever it is, I don't know, and maybe I've totally misread that. But uh, why, why is he so uh, reluctant to discuss that? Why, why is he so fearful uh, to have people talk about it? I mean, and it all goes well, even back. Even to acknowledge that the hacking took place. I mean, and you know, it goes back to the income tax. You know, uh, if people were accusing him of doing something uh, in conjunction with the Russians, I would guess that if he released his income tax and he weren't, it would be reflected. But, well, but and, and don't you assume that, that uh, Robert Mueller has the power to look at his income tax? Yes. So he knows. Yeah, well, he may already know. Yeah. We don't know that. But uh, I, I would think that, the, that he would have the uh, authority to do that. I won't put this right on you, but I mean, is there, is there consensus in Washington that, that he will likely survive and will be a viable candidate for re-election in 2020? Charlie, I, uh, it's, it's a question I would ask you if I were doing this interview. <laughs> <laughs> But I have no earthly idea. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, Glenn Thrush, <laughs> who's become one of my favorite reporters, along with Nine Maggie times. Haberman, right. uh, both they of the write New York together Times. often as you New Yorkers. And you know, they came up through the New York tabs, right? And uh, the they're they're Post. very used they're very used to Donald Trump. They 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 both know him, and uh, like when he held his first news conference, and everybody was just aghast at yeah. you know the way it went. Glenn told me, he said, you know, Maggie and I, it was just another Giuliani or another Ed Koch uh, news conference down at New York City Hall. And he said, you know, it's, that's, that's just what we're used to. So it didn't, it didn't uh, upset us or anything. But I asked Rush, uh, the president had done something, and I said, what does that pretend for the future? It was, it was after he had made his little deal with Chuck and Nancy, his, right. new, his new faves. And I said, what, what does this mean for the future? What can we read into that? And, and Glenn said, nothing. He said, you know, uh, we're all used to the 24-7 news, uh, news cycle. He said, Trump's news cycle is in 15-minute segments. And he said, what he does in this 15-minute segment has nothing to do with what he might do in the next 15-minute segment and certainly nothing to do with what happened in the previous 15 and, minutes. And they say he's consumed by television. Yeah. He's constantly watching, keeping an eye on what's being said on Fox and other, you know, all news channels. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I want to turn to some questions from the audience. First of all, if they put the, I've got them here. Actually, oops, good hands, huh? <laughs> uh, uh, so if they put the house lights up and we'll, we will uh, take your questions. And Charlie, when we do this, uh, I'd like to, we have in the audience tonight, um, uh, Andrew yeah, exactly. Schwartz, we'll just do that, but go who, ahead. Was, uh, who worked with me on this book and set up many of these podcasts at CSIS. Uh, and also Lucy Boyd, uh, who is my colleague at CBS and traveled with me last year uh, along the campaign trail. And Lucy wrote the chapter in the book on fake news, and it's, it's all hers. Andrew mm -hmm. knows all about social media and about the new digital right. wave. I'd like to ask them come up and for you all to see them and, uh, and maybe ask them a question or okay, two. Okay, so while, while, while they do that, while they come out, are they ready? Okay, while they do that and they get ready to come out here, Bob has been recently interviewed in a pr proof questionnaire in uh, Vanity Fair, I assume is where it is. And this is what some of his answers were while, while they set it up. Uh, the first answer is, what is your idea of perfect happiness? He said, getting hired. With the possible exception of my daughter's births and my wedding day, the happiest moment of my life was when someone offered me a job. What's your greatest fear? Talking too much. What historical figure do you identify most with? Benjamin Franklin, Perrin. It's an age thing. What living... <laughs> What living person you most admire? My wife, Pat, who's also here. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? Absent-mindedness. What is the trait you most deplore in others? Failure to be on time. What is your greatest extravagance? Golf clubs. Your favorite journey? Driving through the American West. The most important and the most overrated virtue? Common sense. And on and on. So this is 
the Proust questionnaire in Vanity Fair. Uh, so having in, Andrew, welcome. This Lucy. is Andrew, and that's Lucy. Right. <laughs> uh, so raise your hand about anything. Yes. Your question is, how does the media deal with it? Yeah. You know, here's how we deal with it. It's by first understanding our mission and the mission of politicians. And, and it goes this way. The politician delivers a message. Our job is to check it out and see if it's true. Uh, we have only we one weapon, and that is asking questions. We just keep asking questions until we get an answer. And as I've often said, uh, after doing Face the Nation for more than 25 years, sometimes a non-answer is an, an answer. answer. Right. You ask people the same question about three times and if they can't give you an answer, you know they're not mm -hmm. telling the truth. You and sometimes they, the question is more important than the answer. They have something to hide. Uh, you know, the difference in a totalitarian society and our society is in a totalitarian society, uh, the only source of news is the government. In our form of government, citizens have an opportunity to get independently gathered information and compare it to the government's version of events. I think when we show these things, people will come to their own conclusions about, about whether what they think about them. Uh, when I watched Charlottesville unfold, I, I was aghast. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe this was happening. And I'll give it to uh, the folks at Vice, uh, that, that kind of upstart, <laughs> upstart uh, uh, channel. They did a great job. They got ahead of that thing. They did what reporters well, were supposed to do. Well, what they had is they do. had a young woman who, in, who knew them, who had been there in Charlottesville, yeah. working for them, and, and she was just a very good reporter. She would ask them basic, simple questions. Yeah. And, and, you know, and they would try to respond to her. And, and that's the way you do this. I, I always said, I'm not trying to get, when I was you know, on Face the Nation, I wasn't trying to get people to say something they didn't mean. I wanted them to say exactly what they meant and then I would ask them questions about it. And I think that's what that young woman did down there. And I think she performed a real public service. You know, uh, we're not always gonna be the most popular person in the room if we do our job right. But that's the assignment that the founders gave us. And, the, and when we do it right, I think that's when we, we are my most powerful and perform the best service. It's, it's giving people independently gathered information uh, is as crucial to our form of government as the right to vote. I mean, I really believe that. But, you know, Bob, there's, a, there's also a Reuters study out uh, just yesterday that says that uh, trust in the media has grown in the last several months since August, and trust for the president has declined. <laughs> so the media that, you know, is supposed to be the enemy uh, is the more trusted body. And one thing, you know, I, I think... Well, let, me, let me just say, I don't think you meant to say they're supposed to be the enemy. Uh, that's what the, the administration or the administration Steve Bannon Leslie, yeah. has called us the enemy, which was the first time. Right. I mean, there's always been an adversarial relationship, but we weren't necessarily thought of as the enemy or... Right, Bob? Yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. right. <laughs> A lot of people thought it, but... Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, any, let's go. We want to get as many people in as we can. Raise your hand. Uh, at the, on, the, on the aisle on the left, yes, back there. And I also want to get to the audience at the back as well. Right there. Any way to get rid of fake news? You know, uh, Lucy down here, uh, how I came to know Lucy when I was doing this fellowship up at Harvard, she was my research assistant, and she's a very remarkable young woman. She's from New Orleans. She taught school in a Newark inner city school for three years, 
and then went to Harvard and got her degree in public policy. And uh, she may be the smartest person I know, old or young. Uh, but Lucy, you did, Lucy actually wrote the chapter in the book on fake news. Uh, talk to us about what a problem it is and how do we confront it and deal with it. As a former teacher, this might sound biased, but it is education um, about what is out there and what's available. Um, unfortunately, it's not getting better. A recent study just came out, I think, in the last five days, saying that on Twitter, um, equal amounts of real news and fake news are perpetuated through the internet on tweets, retweets, et cetera. So it's not getting better. I think the awareness is what's getting better. Most people are now you know, aware that fake news is a problem and that the Russians did, in fact, buy 3,000 ads on Facebook in an attempt to persuade you of a certain opinion. So I think um, Twitter bots, Facebook ads, all of that stuff is still going to exist. And in the researchers that we've spoken to, whether it be at Harvard or in the media, like what the research you guys have done, is just the awareness factor. Um, and yes, the tech companies can institute policies to change the algorithms that you know, may show you one uh, Facebook ad versus another that may be false, but um, I think the awareness factor is probably the most important. Yeah, but the tech companies um, think that there is an algorithm that's a solution to this problem, and Bob always says, we need human editors, and I think that the social media companies are gonna increasingly come to that conclusion as well. Of course, they have a much bigger pool of things to edit, but there needs to be some human editing. Okay. It's a very, very serious problem, and it's a very complicated problem because you have to get in there and define, you know, you can't outlaw parody, uh, you can't outlaw political criticism, but how do you uh, root out this stuff that is just totally false? And um, I think now the, uh, the media companies are, they do have it front and center and they've realized they're gonna have to find new ways to do this. Uh, I don't think algorithms will eventually be the answer here, but it'll, it'll be part of the answer. Uh, on, the, on the aisle up there, then we'll come. So I'll ask the runners to sort of look around where people are raising their hands so we can expedite this. Um, I wanna go back to the uh, issue of the accomplishments of the administration. And you made a case that they didn't, have not accomplished much in a legislative arena, but then there's the regulatory arena. Right. And all of the work that's being done there, which is relatively unfettered in places like the EPA, the Interior Department, et cetera. What's your assessment of that and how durable is it? How long, you know, what, what will be the ultimate outcome here? Are we really seeing a sea change that's occurring? Well, there's no, there's no question uh, that that they are doing a lot of things uh, in, in those areas. And quite frankly, I, I don't know how far this goes. I mean, I don't think anybody can say at this point, uh, again, it will take public understanding and uh, public uh, recognition of how this is, uh, is affecting uh, individual lives. These, these are things that are not gonna be changed in Washington. They'll be changed out in the country when people decide this is a good thing or a bad thing for them. Uh, you know, I think in the end, administrations are judged on what they do, not what they say they're gonna do or not what they, they brag about. And sometimes it takes people a while to figure that out, but generally speaking, they always do. Okay. Yes, okay. Upstairs. Upstairs. Oh, go. Yes. Good. In the beginning of your journalism career, why did you decide to focus on politics? What was that? Why did you decide to focus on politics in the beginning of your journalism career? You know, I just, I just always did. I always liked politics. My mother was a precinct chairman. Uh, my, uh, she was always interested in politics, and uh, I was just always around politics. The first... I've told this story here at the 92nd Street Y before. Uh, this, the first politician I ever saw, I was 11 years old, and it was 1948 in Texas, and we heard that Lyndon Johnson, who was running for the United States Senate, was coming to the vacant lot where we played baseball, and, and so it was a big event in our, uh, in our neighborhood, and the reason it was a big event is because he was coming in a helicopter, and we had never seen a helicopter. <laughs> I mean, really. 
And so we all, we all went down. My dad took me and my mom, and then, you know, up in the sky, here's this thing we'd, with no wings making all this noise we'd never seen before. And it, on, over the loudspeaker, this is your candidate for the United States Senate, Lyndon B. Johnson, I'll be down there to see you. <laughs> we didn't know if this was God, if this was a politician. We knew exactly how Moses felt when he realized that burning bush was talking directly to him. <laughs> and, and so this, this helicopter landed, he got out, and Johnson made this wonderful speech. And at the end of the speech, he took his hat off and threw it out into the crowd, got back on that helicopter and flew away into the sunset. Well, you know, I, I, I'm 11 years old and I can remember every minute of that day. I can't remember any of these campaign commercials from the last <laughs> campaign and I don't want to. But there's a little add on to this story. Years later, I was telling it to uh, Jake Pickle, who was the congressman who took LBJ's place in the Congress when, when uh, President Johnson was elected, I mean, when uh, Johnson was elected to the Senate. And I was telling him about that and the impression it made on me. And he said, oh, yeah, I said, uh, that, was, that was my job in the campaign. And I said, what? He said, I was a hat catcher. And I said, what do you mean? He said, let me tell you, Lyndon Johnson was the tightest man on the face of the earth. He said, he's not going to waste a hat on a political campaign. So he said, I was going to the University of Texas. and said, my job was to stand on the front row. And when Johnson saw me, he'd throw that hat to me. I'd catch it, run around behind the helicopter, give it back to him, and then he'd fly away. Well, <laughs> you know, when you get off to a start like yeah. that, how are you not going to be interested in politics? And I, I always have from, the, from that day forward. And that's the truth. What was the strength of Lyndon Johnson? He, he had the greatest understanding of human nature since William Shakespeare, I do believe. He, he understood what people needed. He understood if you wanted to ask a fellow to help you for some, to do something, uh, here, here is what you could offer him and, and that, he might, yeah. that he might need. Uh, I have a wonderful friend named Bill Stuckey. Uh, the Stuckey stories, it used to be all across, all across the South. And uh, Stuckey ran for Congress when he was a young man, and uh, he got elected, he, w he won the Democratic primary, and the next day he gets a call on the phone, this is 1964, or I guess, yeah, and, and uh, he said, uh, it, was, it was the president on the phone, and he said, uh, I wanna see you, and, and Stuckey said, oh, great, said, I, when I get to Washington, I'll sure come by. No, no, he said, I wanna see you tomorrow, and he said, well, how am I gonna get there? He said, I'll send a plane for you. So the next day, he went out to Warner Robins Air Force Base, at one of these little Air Force One planes, picked him up and somebody else, took him directly to Andrews Air Force Base. When they got there, uh, the helicopter was waiting, they put him on the helicopter, and they go straight to the south lawn of the White House where a presidential aide came out and escorted Stuckey into the Oval Office, directly into the Oval Office where here is this giant of a man, Lyndon Johnson, who walked up, put his arms around him and said, son, I'm really going to need your help. <laughs> Stuckey said he never once voted against Lyndon Johnson after that. <laughs> He was a great politician, Charlie, yeah. in, in the very best sense of the word. I have to have this, tell the audience this story about when you were at the Forward Star Telegram <laughs> on the day that President Kennedy was assassinated. Well, uh, I was a police reporter in those days, and uh, I didn't get off work till 3 o'clock in the morning, and so I, I was uh, not, uh, I was still asleep the next morning when, when President Kennedy was shot. Uh, in Dallas. My brother, who was in high school, came in and woke me up and said, you better get to the office. The president's been shot. And I was just totally in a, in a, in a, in a fog. I didn't know what was going to happen. And so anyway, I, I got down, and just as I got to the paper, uh, it came over the radio that the president uh, was dead, and I was just in a, in a total fog. And so I went up to the city desk, and I was just trying to help out and answer the phones, and it was total bedlam, as you can imagine. And I picked up the phone, and a woman said, uh, is there anybody there that can give me a ride to Dallas? And I said, well, lady, 
uh, you know, we don't run a taxi here, <laughs> and besides, the president's been shot. And she said, yes, I'm, and I'm just about to hang up the, the phone, you know, and uh, I hear this voice saying, yes, uh, I heard on the radio, I think my son is the one that they've arrested, and it was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. And so I quickly <laughs> forgot that part about the taxi and <laughs> got her address. And, and another reporter and I, he was the auto editor, and I had a TR4 sports car in those days. So it, I thought, well, I can't take that woman over to Dallas. It's about an hour uh, in that sports car. So I asked him, uh, the auto dealers in Fort Worth would give him a uh, car to drive every, every week, and then he'd write up a little report on it in the Sunday paper. These were generally very good reviews, you can imagine. <laughs> free car, free gas, you see how that works. So, so I, his name was Bill Foster, and I said, Bill, what kind of car you got? And he said, a Cadillac, and so we went to the city editor, and in that Cadillac, we, we went out the rest, west side of Fort Worth and picked her up and uh, drove her to the Dallas uh, police station, and I got quite, it was my first really big But you, let, you let the Dallas police people, uh, officials, think that you were a detective? Oh, or? we always did that. You know, <laughs> in, in those days, we didn't tell people who we were. Yeah. If they asked us, we told them. Right. But if, wouldn't they lie did, to them. if they didn't ask, we let them assume that we were cops. And so I always wore a snap brim hat, so I'd look like a, you know, Dick Tracy. <laughs> Some of the older people in the audience will know who Dick Tracy was. Uh, but anyway, uh, when I got to Dallas Police Station, I just walked up the first uniformed cop and I said, I'm the one that brought uh, Oswald's mother over here. Where can we put her where these reporters won't bother her? <laughs> and, well, I was only 26, right? I wouldn't do that now. I don't think I would, yeah. unless, unless I had to. But anyway, I, uh, they actually found me a room in the burglary squad. Yeah. And, and what the great thing about it was, there was a phone back there, and this was before the days of cell phones. And, and if you didn't have a phone, you didn't have a story. And so uh, uh, I would go out in the hall where all the other reporters were, and. Uh, uh, gather up information and go back in from them and to our, because we just were churning out these extras one after the other. So about dark, she said, do you think they'd let me see my son? And I said, well, I'll go ask. So I went to Captain Wilfred's, the chief of homicide, and I said, she'd really like to talk to her son. And he said, well, we probably ought to do that. And they did the, that kind of thing in those days. So we're led into this holding room off the jail, and I'm thinking this is gonna be the biggest story. They're gonna bring him down. I'll hear what he said to his mother, and I may be able to you know, get an interview with him. And so I'm just standing there, and the guy over in the corner said, who are you? And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, uh, are you a reporter? And I said, well, well, yes. And he said, son, and he said a few words I won't mention here, but <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the thrust of it was, you get out of here because I don't want to ever see you again. And so I excused myself, and that was, that was the end of the adventure. But, you know, Charlie, when people ask me, you know, why do you want to, why have you been a reporter for so long? And it, it, that's why. I mean, you should never do a job unless it's fun and unless, unless you really enjoy doing it. And then it, it doesn't seem like work. And that's why I, I still get up and I still get excited yeah. about going to the office. And, and that's what I tell young people like Lucy, who, by the way, is now a part of the investigative unit over at 60 Minutes and is just doing a great job. Yeah. Yeah. I tell them, you know, if, if, if it's, this is not for everybody. And if you, if you don't get a kick out of doing it, uh, then find something else to do. There are a lot of other good jobs. I'd second but, that. Uh, yeah. I tell you, I just loved it. All right, let me, I'll try to get as many questions as I can before we have to go. Yes, sir, right here. And, and yes. Okay. I can't see where the people with microphones are. Okay, there's one there. Where is another one? Sorry. All right. As a lawyer, I've come to the conclusion that our president does not have a fifth grade understanding of civics, the separation of powers, and the rule of law. Bob, and if you wish to opine, Charlie, your comment, please. Charlie. No, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't. The, the mic is kind of muffled here, okay. and I really. I was asking about the rule of law, the separation of powers, and whether, in my view, our president has an understanding of a fifth grade level of civics. I truly believe he does not. And I'm wondering, given your perspective and experience with Congress. I think he has 
a wide unfamiliarity <laughs> with how the government operates and, and, and the process of government would be the way that I would put it. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you one thing that's sort of not quite on target, but when I did this interview for 60 Minutes with Steve Bannon, you know, and I basically said, you know, you've just been saying all these wonderful things about the president. Don't you know anything about him that, that, uh, that there's no observation you've made? And he said to me, well, he came to Washington he, he, from the real estate world in New York, and he understood personalities, but he didn't understand institutions. He had no sense of institutions, you know, and I explained to him, you've got to learn to respect the CIA. You've got to learn to respect the FBI. You've got to learn to respect institutions. Uh, and, and see them as more powerful than the individuals that are there, any one individual. And you know, and I, I thought think, there was a certain truth to that. I, I think that's right. And I think a lot of people who come to government, who uh, come from business or different places, uh, even from the military, uh, the office of president is not one where you can really order people around. It's a leadership position where you have to persuade people. And uh, I think that, I think there are a lot of people that come to government that they don't really understand that until they get there. It's not a management job. It's a leadership job, and there really is a difference. In fact, Harry Truman said that to, Lynn, to, to General Eisenhower, when General Eisenhower succeeded him. He said, you know, you're gonna realize that just because you say something has to be done, it's not necessarily gonna be done. Uh, that it requires a certain element of persuasion here. President it's not Trump, that way in the military. Pre President Trump has an understanding of popular culture, though, beyond most people. In fact, if you noticed, um, during the whole NFL um, situation, LeBron James came and gave a press conference. And I don't know if anybody noticed the optics of it, but LeBron James wore a tank top to the press conference, and he filled up the screen with his entire body, and he called the president a bum, and he said a bunch of other things. You didn't hear Donald Trump tweeting or talking about LeBron James. Why? LeBron James is probably the most popular person in America. Donald Trump understands popularity, understands popular culture. It's a good okay. point. Yeah, yeah, in the middle of that. Okay. North Korea. North Korea. Okay. The question is That's an easy one. <laughs> a country near China. What, what, I'm serious, what, the question is what the president should do or what you think he'll do or has he handled it well or all of the above. What would you recommend he do? What would you recommend the president do in North Korea? Uh, number one, stop tweeting. Uh, number two, uh, confer with people you trust and, and with your advisors. There, we have some real experts uh, on, on North Korea in this country, but this is something that is gonna take a lot of work and a lot of time uh, to, to work out because uh, I did a long uh, interview with uh, uh, Evan, uh, Osnos. Uh, Evan, Osnos. Evan Osnos, who just got back from North Korea. He wrote this really good piece, about a 15,000 word piece in, New York, in the New Yorker. And Evan came back and he said, I've never felt uh, at the conclusion of a pro project like I do about this one in that I come away with a sense that we have no more understanding of North Korea and their expectations than they do of ours. Uh, I think this is probably one of the most dangerous uh, situations uh, right now uh, going on. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know how we're going to work this out, but we have to, or we're going to wind up with millions of people killed. I mean, uh, we all know that to this day, people don't know why it was that World War I happened, how we just kind of blundered into that. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, and we could uh, find the same kind of situation confronting us now. So. I just hope that wise heads will prevail and uh, that we'll be very, very careful. I think this has to be done not on camera. 
but off camera. I think that's the most important part here. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I do not think that the tweets help this situation at all. In fact, I think they exacerbate it. We have a new study at CSIS that examines the last 25 years of relations with North Korea, and it actually shows, it's an interactive graphic that shows that uh, diplomacy does work and diplomacy can ratchet down some of the rhetoric. Gun okay. control. Gun control. Yeah. Well, I mean, the obvious, obviously people are talking, thinking about gun control right now, uh, as they do after every one of these mass killings. Well, I mean, the political will has to develop in this country to do something about it, something meaningful. Uh, I think we should. Uh, but right now, with the partisan divide where it is, I think it's going to be very difficult, even after this, uh, to get something done. Uh, but I mean, when you look at 585 people have been killed in mass shootings since uh, June of 2016, uh, and they keep going on. There are more mass killings. There's now, we're now averaging more than one a day in this country. And, and I define a mass killing as being something where somebody? four people have been shot. Uh, more than one a day. What can the press do about this? What can what? The press do. What can the press do about it? I think we can keep, keep reporting on what's happening. And uh, I, I don't know what else we can do. We, we can do about this what we can do about everything is just keep uh, yeah. publicizing it would yeah. be my answer to that. You know, and, and sometimes and, this works and, and sometimes it doesn't. All right, I'm trying to get as many people in, but I can't. Um, there seems to be a very interesting agenda uh, for the Supreme Court in the uh, coming term. Uh, would you care to speculate on how Judge Gorsuch might um, influence the uh, court on any of the upcoming decisions? You know, I'm not going to speculate because I really don't know. Uh, and that, that really is just kind of one part of Washington that I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself uh, certainly not an expert and, and really not even well informed on that. Would, I, I, I'll tell you one small thing only because of Justice, I was here with uh, yeah. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg the other night. Um, and in preparing for that interview, one thing about him, I mean, they think he's going to be more vocal than, than um, many new justices are, and he's already one of the more intense questioners uh, compared to, say, uh, Justice Sotomayor, who's a, who's a very intense and, and frequent questioner. But that does not speak to you know, particular decisions that the, course is, the court's going to be facing. Yes? Do you think that the uh, President and the Secretary of State are playing good cop, bad cop? I'm trying to understand why it is that the Secretary of State is trying to do something diplomatic and the President is saying it's a waste of time. Well, what is it? Is it yeah. you know, are, are they playing games with, with the world? How can we have any credence with it, it throughout the globe if we don't know what we're doing ourselves? I, I, can, I cannot make any, it, it, it simply, if they have a plan here, I don't understand what it is. And I don't understand what it is they would hope to gain by it. Uh, I mean, you know, the talk in Washington is that that uh, this this may be the final straw for Tillerson, but I have I have to nothing to, to back that up. You see these people raising their hands? Okay, then here's one right here. here. You're up close. You don't need a mic. I can't get her to. She's having a difficulty getting over here. Just can you get the mic? There you go. And where are the other people with the microphones? Okay, the only two. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. It's a question for both of you. Knowing what you know. How much real damage do you think is being done? And do you think that we can recover from it? I mean, God forbid he gets elected to another term, but I'm terrified. Charlie? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> I have a huge um, confidence in the capacity of the nation and its resilience and the values and, and that uh, to, to withstand um, any president 
uh, that in terms of the kind of, relative to what this president has said or done. I do have confidence in the capacity of the country and the country's people. Yeah, I do. Uh, uh, and I've also seen in, in, in leadership in a variety of places, and Bob said this is a job of, President's job of leadership. I have seen, I mean, this is not in, 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 at all compared, but there have been presidents who have, in a sense, seemed to be overwhelmed by the job. Uh, and then the next president will come along, you know, and, and will have a, a, a clear sense of, of direction and vision, and will show that the job is not bigger than the capacity of somebody to handle. So I, I do have confidence, first of all, in the people, secondly, our institutions and our values and our constitution, you know, to respond to this. You know, I was here in 1968 and, and we all went through that. We covered it. I mean, I literally thought the country was coming apart at the seams. And somehow or another, uh, we, we got past that. And I, I bring that up only to say, you know, this is not the first t tough time that we've gone through uh, as a country, and it certainly won't be the last. But I will also say I'm very worried right now. I I'm worried about the country. Uh, this inability that we have to uh, come to a consensus on almost anything mm -hmm. is extremely worrisome. Yeah, but let me, can I add, Bob, go ahead. Yeah. But, but I, I see, I think that inability to come to a consensus uh, the gridlock in Washington was before this president. I mean, I think there, I, I interviewed President Obama uh, near the end of his term, and, and I said to him, you know, you, 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 you believe we have the strongest value, strongest constitution, you believe we're an exceptional nation, you believe we have the strongest military, the strongest economy, the strongest technology, the strongest science. You know, what could go wrong? And he said, what could go wrong is our politics. And that is what's wrong with the country. But it preceded this president. You know, how this president has added to it has caused great concern to a lot of people because he seems, as it was expressed here earlier, somehow un uninformed by the kinds of norms and standards and qualities that have preceded him. You know, uh, Ron Chernow, who wrote that wonderful biography of Hamilton and also of George Washington, uh, he said in the book at one point, the founders didn't promise us a perfect government, they promised us self-government. And we have to remember that, self-government. And we have to not turn away, we have to remain engaged. And, and at this point, I think, I think most people still are. I mean, this is a full house here tonight, uh, and I think I think that's a good thing. I mean, I don't take it as a compliment to me. I take it as a, as a sign that people are interested and they they are concerned and and uh, they want to know what what can they do. And, yeah, and, and, uh, and they're also and, concerned about the things that Bob speaks to in this book, by the way, to make a plug. For and books. so, uh, you know, I mean, all is not lost. But having said that, I, I'm I'm concerned. Okay, you know, I'm you know I think. Um, can I just guy, add something real quick, Charlie? Ahead. I think one thing to take heart in is that even though um, parents don't want their kids to go into politics, and that's pretty clear. I have three sons, and my wife would rather them go into professional wrestling than to go into <laughs> politics. Um, take heart in that the young people in this country, the millennials, are more adroit studiers of media, and they're more into media, and. Their phones are their televisions. Their, their phones are their communication device. They have their own media. They, they consume media at a rate that would make all of our heads spin. They're looking at Vox, they're looking at Mike, they're looking at um, BuzzFeed, they're looking at Vice you all mentioned before. And some of the media that you see out there isn't fake news, it's real news. And the reporting that they're doing is absolutely extraordinary. Um, Bob and I talk to them all the time on our podcast, every week, and each week we meet a, a new young person who's a reporter who's new to the scene, and, you know, Bob's saying things to them sometimes like, you know, I worked with your father, um, I worked with your, you know, uh, your aunt. These people are the next generation of news media, they're the next generation of leaders, and I have a lot of faith in them. This um, is a good example right yeah, over here. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, I have to... I I'm sadly have to uh, bring a hold of this for the following reason. Bob's got to sign some books here, and we've got a lot of books out there, and some of you, uh, as you go to see him to get books signed, may be able to ask questions, but I apologize uh, that we couldn't get to everybody. 
Uh, but we got to a number of you, and it's been a great thrill for me Thank you. to have Bob. Thank you.